are Vikings. We pillage, raid, hunt, exploring, and we feed Odin. Who can do the most efficient job and have the best family possessions to please Odin? Do you want to learn how to play a feast for Odin? In this video, we're going to take you through the full rules for this game, and if you stay tuned till the end, you can pick up some tips and strategies along the way. Coming up. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Nippon University. We bring you a variety of quality board game videos. So if you're new here, please consider subscribing and do hit the bell to be notified of when we post new videos. Now let's get to the rules of A Feast for Odin, game by Uwe Rosenberg, published by Z-Man Games. In A Feast for Odin, players play the role of competing Viking societies trying to become the wealthiest. Through the game, players will grow population, harvest plants, hunt, gather building materials, build ships, build houses, raid, pillage, and explore. All of this is done through a series of competitive worker placement actions on this main board. A player's central aim is to gain as many tiles and silver as possible, and to acquire enough space to store it all. Players will gain points, or more correctly, avoid losing points, for all of the goods that they manage to gain and accommodate, as well as their ships and a few other bonuses. And after seven rounds, the player with the highest score wins. I'm not going to step you through the full setup for a Feast for Odin. There are a lot of steps and you can follow the rulebook, it's very good. This is ultimately what the common area of the table will look like. The key things to note are to make sure that your four exploration boards are on the correct side, identified by their titles, and that these two extension boards are used only in the four player game. Each player will start with a player board, 12 viking meeples, 5 of which go in this square and 7 of which cover the round marker spaces, then also some mead, a spear, a snare and a bow which come from the weapons deck and are placed face up, and a starting occupation card from the light brown occupation starting deck which is kept face down or in the player's hand. Choose a first player who takes the moose and you're now ready to play. Each of the seven rounds of A Feast for Odin plays over 12 phases. Don't be alarmed by this number, many of them are quick upkeep type phases. I'm going to summarize these quickly first and then we'll come back and look through each phase in more detail. In A New Viking, players will gain one new active meeple. In The Harvest, players will gain the orange food tokens that their Vikings have been growing. In Phase 3, you'll set up the exploration boards for this round. In Phase 4, each player will draw one new weapon card. Then Phase 5 is the actions phase, and this will be the major part of the game. Starting with the first player and going clockwise around the table, players will take it in turns to place one or more Vikings from their active pools onto an action space, immediately taking the action covered. An action may take anywhere between one and four Vikings to complete. This phase ends once all players have run out of active Vikings. In phase six, you determine who gets the moose for the next round. In phase seven, players will gain an income in silver based on what they've been building onto their player boards. In phase eight, players with breeding pairs of animals will breed new animals. Then in phase nine comes the feast. Here, players must feed their active population by discarding orange grown components and red meat components. In phase 10, the bonuses, players can gain some bonus tokens based on what they've encircled on their boards. In phase 11, you'll reset the mountain strips which will bring new building resources into the game. And in phase 12, all Vikings will be removed from the main board and returned to the player's supply. You'll go through this process seven times through the game, ending after the feast in round seven. You can also play a shorter variant lasting six rounds. So now let's look at each step in detail. The first phase is to gain a new Viking. Take the leftmost Viking from your track and add it to your active supply. The number you reveal is the current round number. Phase 2 is the harvest, and you'll refer to this orange box here to understand the harvest. In A Feast for Odin, it's assumed that your Vikings already know agriculture before you even take any actions. And the harvest phase gives you the benefit of that automatic agriculture. 
In this phase, each player will take the orange crop tokens matching the bag shown in this round. So in round one, each player will take these three tiles, each of which shows the number one bag down in the corner. In round two, each player will take another one of these three tiles, as well as one of these. In round three, there is no harvest. It's a lean year and you'll have to make do with what you grew the previous round. In round four, you'll gain these four tokens again, as well as one of these. There's no harvest in round five, and in round six, you'll gain all of these again, plus one of these. In this way, the harvest will bring in a reasonable amount of food, and this is a lot of what you're going to use for the feasts in phase nine of the round. In phase three, you'll prepare the exploration boards, and what you do is shown in this blue strip here. In rounds one and two, nothing will happen. In round three, you find board A, Shetland, and flip it over to its other side, Bear Island. Then add two silver to each board that you did not flip. In round four, you'll flip over the Faroe Islands, discarding any silver that's on it. Then once again, you'll add two silver to each board that you did not flip. You'll repeat this process with board C in round five and board D in round six. In phase four, each player will simply draw the top card from the weapons deck and add it to the supply of weapons. Then you'll proceed to phase five, the actions phase. The actions phase is played using the central action board, as well as the extensions in a four player game. Because of its length, we're gonna focus in on it section by section. Beginning with the player who has the moose token and going clockwise around the table, each player will take it in turns to place one or more active Vikings onto an action space and then take that action immediately. Once an action space is occupied, it cannot be occupied by another player's Vikings. Action spaces are split into four columns. The first column requires one Viking. The second column requires two Vikings placed at once. The third column requires three Vikings to take an action, and either before or taking the action, the player may draw the top occupation card from the dark brown pack into hand. And the fourth column requires four Vikings, and before or after taking the action, allows the player to also take the play occupation action. This involves taking an occupation card from hand and playing it face up for its effect, but we'll come back to that action later. Since players will be placing different numbers of meeples on each turn, players may run out of Vikings before their opponents. Once players are out of Vikings, their turns are skipped until all players are out of Vikings, at which point the actions phase ends. So now let's look at all the actions in the game, and there are a lot of them. There is some color coding on the board, which will help you identify the sorts of actions you're taking. The green spaces are the most basic way of getting goods in the game. So let's look first at what you do with goods. During the game, whenever you collect goods, building resources, or silver, it will go into an off-board collection known as your supply. From your supply, you'll be able to spend those goods and resources on other actions, or maybe upgrade them. As we saw before, part of your aim in the game is to get your goods onto your player boards, like so. I'll explain the full rules about this placement later on, but the critical thing is that once you've placed goods or resources onto a board, you're not allowed to take them back off, and therefore you can no longer spend or upgrade them. This is true for goods, silver, and building resources. So with this in mind, let's head back to our production actions, remembering that goods in, and anything spent, come from your supply. So, the green coloured actions in the game are as follows. Under the hunting subset, you can go here to catch one fish. At the livestock market, you can buy animals. Here, pay one silver for two fish. Here, pay two silver for two salted meat. Here, pay one silver to gain a sheep. Whenever you take a sheep or a cow, you'll need to place it initially on the non-pregnant side. And this is the one showing a lower victory point value. Here, pay three silver to get a non-pregnant cow and a bucket of milk. Here, take a sheep for free, or spend one silver to take a cow. And here, pay three silver to take both a sheep and a cow. As you can see, as you require more Vikings to take the actions, the actions become more powerful. The weekly market is a place to get various sorts of food. Here, you will gain beans and a silver. Here, gain flax, fish, and a silver. 
Here, gain fruits, oil, salted meat, and a silver. And then these actions are production actions. Here, gain one bucket of milk for each cow in your supply, up to a maximum of three. Here, you'll gain two mead and two silver. Here, you will gain one wool for each sheep in your supply, up to a maximum of three. And finally here, you will gain one spices, one silver, two buckets of milk as long as you have at least one cow, and one wool as long as you have at least one sheep. The next subsection, shown by this beige colour, is the mountains and trade section, and this is where you'll be gaining building resources and trading to upgrade your goods. Relevant to these actions are the mountain strips. You'll have two completely filled at the start of the game, and a new one will be added at the end of each round. This action here shows the icon showing a single mountain strip, the number two, and a bundle of resources. When taking this action, the player chooses any one mountain strip, and then takes the two leftmost resources from that strip. The player cannot split these choices across different strips. This action does not involve a mountain strip and the player simply takes one wood for each player in the game, plus an ore. These come from the general supply and not from the mountain strips. This action allows the player to take three resources from one mountain strip and two resources from another. This action allows the player to take one resource from a mountain strip and do one upgrade. And so let's look more closely at this upgrade icon. Each upgrade icon shows this grid shows a number on the left and a number of arrows on the right. The number on the left is the number of tiles which may be upgraded. The number of arrows on the right is the number of steps that tile may be upgraded by. So this action here, in addition to the mountain strip, is to upgrade one tile one step. And the tiles must come from the player's supply. To upgrade an orange tile, flip it over to its red side. To upgrade a red tile, return it to the box and take the matching sized green tile. And to upgrade a green tile, flip it over to its blue side. So returning to the action spaces. This space allows you to take three resources from a mountain strip and upgrade one tile. This space allows you to upgrade three different tiles by one step and draw four weapons cards. It is important to remember that these upgrades must be two different tiles. You cannot upgrade the same tile more than once. This space allows you to take four resources from one strip and upgrade two tiles twice each. Here you can upgrade two tiles once, here you can upgrade three tiles once, and here you can upgrade four tiles once. Here take two building resources from each of four mountain strips or upgrade three tiles twice each. All of these actions are the primary way of getting building resources and one of the major ways of upgrading to higher value goods. White coloured actions are exchange actions, generally exchanging one good or resource for another, and you'll find these in the building and crafting sections of the board. Here you can exchange a flax for a linen. Here you can exchange a stone for a silver and a rune. Here you can exchange linen and hide for clothing and two silver. Here, you'll exchange either a wood or an ore for a treasure chest and a silver. Here, you'll exchange one ore to make a forged good. Forged goods are any goods tiles showing this tongs symbol. This can be the jewellery, or it can be any of the specially shaped tiles in this section of the special tiles board. It can also be the crucifix. It was really just a design error that this wasn't included in this section of the board. After paying the ore, take any one of these forged goods tokens of the player's choice. Here, spend two stone and two wood in order to get two runes and two treasure chests. And finally here, gain four silver, exchange wool for a robe, and exchange silverware for jewellery. The building actions allow players to build houses, sheds, and ships. Here, spend two wood to build a shed. Sheds are placed next to the player's player board and provide a place to put excess building resources for points. Here, spend one stone to build a stone house. The stone house also provides a place for excess resources and for excess goods. Here, spend two stone to build a long house. 
The longhouse is another place where excess tiles can be placed for victory points. I'll talk again about how you place tiles into these locations later in the video. In the next three spaces, you can spend wood to build different types of ships. Here, you'll spend one wood to build a whaling ship. Here, you'll spend two wood to build a knar. And here, you'll spend two wood to build a long ship. Anytime you build ships, they'll go onto these spaces on your player board. Whaling ships go into these top three spaces and you may have a maximum of three. Knars and long ships go into these bottom spaces and you have a combined maximum of four. It's important to tell these ones apart as they are the same size. The knars are worth five victory points and have a blue sail. The long ships are worth eight victory points and have a red sail. Building ships has a few benefits in the game. As a default, they're worth this number of victory points, and so you've converted wood into points. Secondly, there are different types of actions in the game, which we'll go through shortly, for which you require a certain type of ship as a prerequisite. Thirdly, later in the game, you'll be able to flip the ships over by taking the emigration action, and this will increase the number of victory points it's worth. A couple of other free actions surrounding ships. If you don't want to build a ship, you can buy one for silver as a free action at any time. Simply pay an amount of silver equal to that ship's victory point value, returning that silver to the supply. Because silver is worth one victory point per coin, you've not gained any victory points by doing this, but you've gained the ship and the actions that that unlocks. Secondly, as we'll see later in the video, the power of a whaling vessel or a longship in performing its actions is increased if you load the ships with ore. Whaling boats have a pre-printed ore and can hold one additional ore. Long ships can hold up to three ore. You may load ore onto one of these ships as a free action at any time, but you can never retrieve the ore from those ships once it's placed. The final action in the building section is to spend two stone and two wood to take either a stone house and a long ship or a long house and a knar. Next we'll talk about the blue actions, which are all of the mercantile type actions. These actions are only open to players who have at least one knar. The first two actions are the same. Here, the player pays one silver to upgrade any number of dissimilar green tiles to their blue sides. This is one of the most efficient ways to upgrade in the game, if you can time it right. The other knar action is to purchase special tiles from the special board. Each tile on this board, except for the English crown, has a cost to purchase in silver printed on the side. And so the player taking the action may choose any two tiles, pay the combined silver cost, and then take them into their supply. Next, we'll talk about hunting. And this is the first of the game's dice rolling actions. First, we'll look at hunting game which is present twice on the board and involves rolling the orange d8. When hunting, the player is trying to roll low and the player has three rolls to try to target a result that the player is seeking. The player may stop rolling at any time and must take the final value rolled. So if the player risked re-rolling this two to try to seek a one, but got a higher number, the player would be stuck with it. After completing the rolls, the player has two options either succeed or fail. To succeed, the player must pay a combined number of bows and wood, equaling the number rolled. Then the player gains the reward, one hide and one meat. If the player is unsuccessful, then the player takes a bow and a wood as compensation. Take the bow card from the weapons discard pile if there is one, and if not, search through the weapons pile for a bow. The player is allowed to declare the hunt a failure and gain the compensation, even if the player has enough wood and bows to pay the cost. The laying a snare action works in much the same way. The player has up to three rolls of the d8, trying to roll a low number. To succeed, the player must pay that number in wood or snares, and as a reward, takes a fur and retrieves a snare, because a snare isn't expended once you've trapped an animal. If unsuccessful, the player gains a snare and a wood as compensation and gets to retrieve one of the two meeples placed on the space. As you'll see throughout the game, failing on these dice rolling actions does give you plenty of compensation and doesn't hurt your game too badly. 
The next action is whaling. Whaling may only be carried out by a player with at least one whaling boat. To whale, the player has three rolls of the blue d12 and is again trying to roll low. After the player has finished rolling the die, deduct from its value the total number of ore cubes, including the printed cubes, on that player's whaling vessels. This would count as a result of three. Once again, to have a success, that value must then be paid either in wood or spears. If successful, the player gains whale meat, oil, and skin and bones. If unsuccessful, the player gains a spear and a wood and retrieves two meeples as compensation. The only caveat is if the player's die roll minus the amount of ore is ever equal to zero, the player cannot re-roll and is not allowed to declare this a failure. There are two whaling spaces on the board, and the only difference between them is that here you can deduct the ore value from all of your whaling ships combined, here you can only deduct the ore value from one whaling ship. Next we'll talk about the longship actions, raiding, pillaging, and plundering. Raiding and pillaging work much the same way, but we'll look at pillaging first. To pillage, you must have at least one longship. It helps if that longship is loaded up with ore. You will roll a d12, again rolling up to three times, but this time you are trying to roll high. To your die roll, add the amount of ore on your most heavily laden longship. That would turn this five to an eight. You may increase your battle score further by spending stone or swords. Spending this stone and the two swords would increase that eight to an 11. Once again, you may then declare your pillage either a success or a failure. If successful, you can take one blue or special tile with a sword value equal to or less than your battle score. The lowest successful battle score you can have is a 6 for this rune, and the highest is 16 for the English crown, which is worth two victory points on its own. If you choose to fail, or your battle score is less than 6, in which case you automatically fail, then as compensation you'll gain one sword and one stone, and retrieve one meeple from the action. Raiding works in much the same way, but is less powerful. Here you will roll a d8, again trying to roll high. You do not get to add the ore value from any of your longships, but you are still allowed to spend stone or swords to increase the battle value. As before, if you're successful, gain a blue or special token with a sword value equal or less than your battle value, and if you fail, take a sword and a stone as compensation. The final longship action is plundering, and to take this action you require at least two longships. You do not need to roll any dice, you simply take a silver horde token. Next we'll talk about exploration. There are eight islands you can explore in the game, with up to four visible at any time. As we saw earlier, we'll progressively be flipping these over to their opposite sides, giving new places to explore. Each of these actions works in the same way. The player must have at least one of the matching type of ships shown, then takes the exploration board tile from the main supply, and places it next to the player board. This gives the player a new place to put goods, a new way to get income, and a new way to get points. If you collect an exploration tile with silver accumulated on it, you also take that silver. These actions take progressively more meeples and higher quality ships the later we get into the game. One meeple and any type of ship will get you either Shetland or Faroe Islands, and these are the lowest value islands which will be gone, that is flipped, after round four. Iceland and Greenland, which are visible from the start, and Bear Island, which becomes visible in round three, require a Knarr or better, and two meeples. While Baffin Island, Labrador and Newfoundland, potentially worth the most points of all, require three meeples, and none of these appear until at least round four. Again, we'll talk about how to place goods onto your exploration tiles later in the video. The immigration actions are shown in yellow. These require a longship or a Knarr. To take either of these actions, pay an amount of silver equal to the current round number. Then, take the ship, discarding any ore which happens to be on it, flip it over to the other side and move it up to this location. Subsequent emigrations will be stacked continually from the left. Emigrating increases the value of that ship in victory points by 13. 
Although remember that the silver you spent on the action was also worth one point each. And so taking the action in round seven is a net gain of six points. Emigrated ships are no longer available for you to use on actions. And so this player in this case would not be able to take longship actions anymore. The other benefit of emigrating, which we'll see shortly, is that by sending some of your population away, you'll reduce the size of your feast. Here, you can discard a whaling boat, as well as any ore that you've placed on it, and upgrade it into Knar, and then take the emigration action. The final colour of action space are the brown ones, which relate to your occupation cards. This action allows the player to draw an occupation card, as well as gain one silver. This one allows the player to pay a stone or an ore in order to play an occupation card, as well as gain one silver. To do this, take a card and display it face up. This will be worth a number of victory points between negative two and positive three, with one special card worth seven, and will have some sort of in-game effect. Yellow effects trigger immediately. Red effects when trigger whenever you take a certain action. Blue effects can be taken at any time, and green cards trigger off some other effect in the game. The appendix booklet explains the 190 different occupations that come with the game. This space here allows the player to play one or two occupation cards for free, and this space allows the player to play up to four occupation cards for free. The final action spaces in the game are the imitation actions, which are used only in the four player game. These can be in different columns, depending on which sides you set these two tiles up in. Imitating allows you to copy an action from the same column that another player has already used. And that summarises all of the different actions available in the game. As you can see, there are a lot of different pathways, and you should be able to find a pathway which doesn't interfere too much with what other players are doing. That way you can avoid your precious action spaces being taken by opponents as much as possible. After the actions phase is complete, you'll determine the new start player. Whichever player was the last to place Vikings on the board in the last actions phase becomes the new start player and gets the moose. Before we talk about phase 7, income, we need to talk about how to place goods onto your boards. What I'm about to describe can be done as a free action at any time, but before income is the most sensible time to do it. There are three types of tile which can go onto your home board. Green, Blue, and Special. Although they are a slightly different colour, all of these special tiles count as if they are blue. And so all rules for blue tiles hold for these as well. Onto your home board, you can also place ore cubes and silver. The game comes with several enjoined silver pieces. You can always freely cash these in with the separated ones. This icon here reminds you of the placement restrictions. You can place blue and green goods, as well as silver and ore, but when you place green goods, they cannot be orthogonally adjacent. As such, these would all be legal placements, but this is not allowed. On your board, you'll see three different types of printed feature. These are income squares printed along a diagonal. These five spaces here are called bonuses. And then there are a series of negative one victory point icons. At the end of the game, you will lose one point for each of these icons that you've failed to cover. Other than not placing green adjacent to green, there is only really one placement restriction on this board. And that is that you cannot cover one of the spaces on the income diagonal unless you have covered all the spaces below and to the left. So this would be a legal placement because in one step, it covers both this income space and everything in the square below it. This would also be legal, because any of these bonus spaces count as being pre-covered. However, this would not be a legal placement, because spaces on the income diagonal are being covered over without filling in everything below. The implications of this are that players can place their big items up here to avoid losing points, but if they haven't filled in everything down here, they will have to work around these spaces in the top part of the diagonal. Although the bonus squares count as being pre-covered, players are allowed to cover over those again. However, what players will often try to do is completely encircle one of these bonus squares, since once it's completely encircled, 
the player will be eligible to claim that bonus in phase 10, the bonus phase of each round. Bonus spaces on the edge of the board require fewer tiles to encircle them. The rules concerning placement on the exploration boards is exactly the same as the home board. A couple of key differences to note on these islands is that sometimes you'll need to interpret the income rules quite literally. So here, to cover up the one income space, these two spaces below would need to be covered either before or at the same time as covering that. Exploration tiles often come with some nice bonus squares which are often easier to get than the home board, but they're made challenging by the strange shape of their outline. Some also have interior lakes and features which you're not allowed to cover, and this is indicated by a thicker border. Sheds and houses have slightly different placement rules. Green tiles may now be placed adjacent to other green tiles. And red and orange tiles may be placed onto these boards. However, red may not be orthogonally adjacent to red, and orange may not be orthogonally adjacent to orange. Or cannot be placed into one of these boards, but silver can. Once again, encircling the bonus spaces will grant a bonus, and the longhouse has two central pillars which cannot be covered. Finally, these sheds and stone houses offer places where players can place their excess stone and wood. Once again, doing this will cover up these spaces which will lose you victory points. In all cases for these boards, once you've placed goods and resources onto the board, you cannot take them off again to spend or upgrade any time later in the game. So, now that we understand placement, we will look at phase 7, the income phase. Here, the player gains income in silver equal to the lowest visible income number on the home board and any exploration boards. Here, the player would gain 4 silver for the home board and 3 silver for Iceland. Income for all boards is gained simultaneously, so the player would not be able to use income from one board to cover income numbers on the other. Phase 8 of each round is animal breeding. A breeding pair of animals will produce one new offspring every alternate round, and that will occur during this phase. So let's look at the three ways that this can work. If you do not have a breeding pair of an animal, then you take no action in this phase. If you have at least two of a type of animal in your supply, and none of them are pregnant, flip one over to the pregnant side. You can do this with each of your species of animal. And if you have a pregnant animal, you may flip it back to the non-pregnant side and produce one offspring. Once again, you will do this with each of your species. The nature of the animal breeding is that you'll never produce more than one animal per two rounds in each species. Your player board does have slots called stables where you can keep your animals. However, unlike on the main board, animals who are there can be spent to do upgrade actions or can be used in the feast. And that's the next phase to look at. Phase 9 in each round is the feast. Here, the player must feed the population by spending food products, which are any orange and red tiles. The amount of food required is any empty squares on this track between any emigrated vessels and any Vikings who are yet to be activated. The feast track has its own placement rules. You may place red tiles, orange tiles, or silver. But red may not be placed next to red, and orange may not be placed next to orange. You can use silver or the other colour to split them apart. In the feast, you are required to have variety and you are penalised if you don't. The first tile of a certain type of food may be placed horizontally, but any others must be rotated to their less favourable vertical configuration. As such, if you don't plan for variety, you'll end up spending a lot more food on your feast. Square foods, of course, do not penalise you when you double up. To make a legal placement, you must be able to fit them in exactly, you're not allowed to overhang. But you are allowed to rotate the first of a certain food type in its unfavourable position in order to make it fit. In the event that you are unable to complete the feast, you must take a negative three point penalty for each square that you're unable to fill. All food spent in the feast is discarded. The tenth phase of each round is the bonuses phase, and here you'll go back to all your boards and get any bonuses that you've completely encircled on all sides. Here the player would get a fish from Iceland, 
beans from the longhouse, and ore, wood, and mead from the home board. Once again, all of these bonuses are gained immediately, and these tiles cannot be placed onto the boards to gain more bonuses in the same round. Phase 11 of each round is to update mountain strips. Remove the leftmost remaining resource from each mountain strip, and then discard any strips that are now empty. Draw a new strip from the supply at random, and load it up with resources. In the final round of a four-player game, you will have run out of strips, and so you do not draw a new strip. Finally, in Phase 12, all players retrieve all of their Vikings from the main board, back to their player board, ready for a new round. The final round of the game is played in a subtly different way. You will skip over the income step in the final round, but you will still gain the points for your final income. You'll do animal breeding and the feast one more time, and then the game will end. To score, you'll go through all the positive and negative steps on this score sheet. Any ships in your fleet will be worth the printed points. Here it's 14. Any ships that have emigrated will be worth their printed points. Here it's 39. Exploration boards will score the points shown in the top right corner. Here it's 16. Sheds and houses score the points in their top right corners. Here it's 25. Any sheep or cattle in the player's collection will be worth the points printed on front of it. For pregnant animals, this will be one point more than the base animal. Any occupation cards that the player has played will score the victory points in their top corner, so here it's 5. Leftover silver is worth 1 point each, so here it's 6. The player's final income is scored in points, again, rather than taking it as coins, so here it's 7 for Iceland and 9 for the home board. And a player who has taken the English crown, this specific goods token, gains 2 points. Then, players lose points for every visible negative points icon. Here, the player will lose 10 points for uncovered spaces on the home board, 5 for uncovered spaces on Iceland, 4 for uncovered spaces on sheds and houses, and 3 for having one feast penalty. Anything else that the player has left over is worth nothing. The player with the highest score wins, and if tied, victory is shared. In this way that you can see that maximising your points in this game is both about getting goods and having places to put them. This treasure chest would be worth 9 points if there was still a place to put it up in the top of the home board, but because the player does not have anywhere that that treasure chest fits, it's worth nothing. Leftover red and orange goods will never be worth anything unless you've invested in houses or sheds to put them in. And the other thing to remember is that with exploration boards, you may be taking on some sort of a risk that you'll fill it up. Iceland, for example, is worth 16 points, but has the potential to lose 24 points if you don't do a good job of filling it. And, sheds and exploration boards are less efficient to cover over the negative one point icons. And so while getting these will increase your points, it will be done at a diminishing return to what you're putting on your base board. So all of these considerations have to factor in to how you increase your Viking Empire. And that's how to play A Feast for Odin. We hope that you enjoyed the video and we hope that you enjoy playing. Now, if you'd like to learn how to play with the Norwegian's expansion for A Feast for Odin, we have a how to play video for this as well, and you can check out the link in the description below. We'll cover what that expansion brings and highlight the differences. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know by hitting the like button, write your questions or feedback in the comment sections below. You can also join our Facebook group, Mibble University Community, to share your love of board games. And finally, if you'd like to be among the first ones notified of what's new from us, please consider subscribing to our channel. You can click on the meeple up in the corner to do so, and do hit the bell to be notified of our new videos. Until next time!